This is the third one of our virtual era. And today we have Tom Harmon from FHWA. Tom is a University of Illinois alum. And before that, he was at the University of Maryland. After being here at UIUC, he went on to, to work in deployment of technology, policy, education, and research at the Federal Highway of, Administ of, of Administration Center for Accelerating Innovation. And today he's going to be talking about precisely that accelerating innovation. So please everyone, as always, mute your mics and use the raise hand button and Tom will get to your questions when he's, he fills his feet. So go ahead, Tom. Okay, Javier, since this is completely student run, uh, I'm gonna ask the students to watch the hand raises because I'm gonna focus on my slides. So if a question comes up, this is meant to be interactive, uh, just unmute and ask the question and we'll go from there. Uh, so today is gonna be fun. I really wish I was there in person. Was there a question? Or you, you, you good with that, Javier? Yeah, that's perfect. So okay, you guys fantastic. can hop in. All right, that is fantastic. Uh, I really wanted to be there in person today. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed my time when I was at the university and uh, Imad and I have uh, uh, shared uh, opportunities to, to work together throughout my career. And I, I'm, it's always a pleasure to be here. And uh, I was looking forward to our dinner, which we'll have soon. So uh, I have a very kind of broad topic, which is the future of highways. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna contextualize it a little bit around pavements, but much broader in the sense of looking at innovation. And as we get started, uh, the word innovation is used, um, I actually think it's overused. Uh, and it's so overused, I really think it needs to be a four-letter word. And what I mean by that is if you're truly innovative and you're truly pushing innovation out into practice, um, it's hard. And really anything worth doing uh, is hard. If it was easy, it would already be done or it would just happen on its own. So as you think about your careers and as you think about your research and what you're doing, anything from the status quo is going to be a struggle and it's going to be difficult. So I'm going to talk a little bit about change management theory as I get down in here, but more specifically how that relates to payments. As always, uh, is that a question or is that just uh, Anthony unmuted? Oops, now he's muted. <laughs> so uh, as always, if you have a question or thought or idea about what I'm talking about today or just anything related to the Federal Highway Administration in general, please reach out to me. Uh, my email is super easy to remember. It's my first name, my last name, at dot.gov. I think there's this Google engine. If you search, you'll find me as well. So thoughts, comments, ideas are very welcome. So what we're going to do over the next 45 minutes or so, and hopefully with a lot of questions, um, talk about our challenge and our challenge as engineers uh, and as innovators that is in front of us today. And it's an extremely exciting time to be there. I think it's more exciting now than it was when I graduated. Some what if scenarios, what's being looked at today, change management theory and what that means. And this is a whole discipline within itself. I'll share with you some of the things that I'm doing at the Federal Highway Administration. And if you have any questions, either raise your hand and Javier will see it. Or if you want to type in the chat, we'll hear that as well. So I am a civil engineer. I have my master's degree. I, I, I did some uh, post studies back at the University of Maryland after Illinois. And along the way, I decided to get into management and then leadership. And now I'm an office director. That means I read a lot of books other than uh, engineering books. So to help grow me as a leader and as a manager. I see Walla McGowers just jump in and another good friend there as well. So hi, Walla. Uh, so one book I read several, several years ago is called Play to Win. And uh, what I usually find is I'll read a management or leadership book and I might find two or three nuggets. This one made me angry. I got to a page and I literally sat the book down and I walked away for a second because it said, anyone can make a difference, most do most don't. What the heck does that mean? But as I've read it more, what it means is a lot of us 
have huge potential, but we'll just kind of do the status quo. We won't challenge or grow or advance our discipline, our industry, um, our community. So change management, as you're going to see a little bit later, is truly a challenge. And it's kind of the hardest part is taking and putting things into practice. So here's our current challenges. And this is neither comprehensive nor mutually exclusive. TRB every year or every other year puts out a report on critical issues in transportation. Uh, one of the first ones is there's a number of transformational innovations that are really disrupting the way we think about and do our job. We have a growing and shifting population and that's putting more and more demands on our infrastructure. Uh, energy and sustainability are, are key challenges that we're facing. Preparing for and dealing with threats, both man-made and natural. Safeguarding our public, because ultimately, as a civil engineer, this is your steward uh, of the public's trust. Serving the disadvantage, uh, not just making really cool things for the people who can pay for it, but making sure that you're integrating and weaving communities together. Managing our system, which is becoming more and more and more complicated. If you look at the history of highway departments, they're now departments of transportation, and they're looking at a host of interrelated intermodal issues. The actual monitoring and uh, measuring of the performance of the system and how we determine performance has changed. Paying the tab is a really big deal. Um, you know, when we talk about infrastructure, it is paid for at the local, state, and federal level. Moving freight, uh, which uh, is a really big issue and a growing issue with regard to the logistics. And here's one that's really key, the workforce. Uh, both getting people to come into transportation, stay in transportation, and then also planning for the succession as we lose those people from tr the transportation community. And then within all of that is how do we prepare for the future? So uh, I encourage you to reach out and look for this document. It's relatively short, but it talks about some of the major issues that we're facing. So this is our challenge, not of the future, but this is the challenge of us right now. So to have a little bit of fun, I want to share some of the things that we're seeing right now that could be part of our future within pavements and infrastructure. So what does this future look like? So here's an example of somebody trying to make a pavement system generate power. So in the Netherlands, they have in place right now uh, solar panel pavement that are generating electricity. Here's an example of a pavement taking power and giving it to a vehicle driving over top of it. So what if you never had to pull over for gas or to recharge your electric vehicle, the pavement actually gave that energy to you. Here's one where we're looking at different ways for the pavement markings to work. Glow in the dark pavement markings, this technology exists today. They actually have a photoluminescence way to make the trees light up as well. Uh, really interesting. Don't know if it has huge application, but things that are being looked at. Uh, here's another example of generating electricity from the pavement system. Now with these, whenever I see a technology that wants to be part of our pavement, where they're going to cut and put things in, then you worry about from a, an engineering perspective, what that's going to do to stress, distress, and maintenance. How do you maintain these type of things? So as we look at these, it's not just, isn't that cool? We're going to generate energy from the pavement but also how do we maintain the pavement system, all of it around that. Uh, there's new sensor technology that's out that's gonna provide us with real-time information about our systems. And then uh, another example that I just think is kind of neat is since we're having more and more autonomous vehicles make it onto the roadway, what if we change the way um, they see things? So instead of trying to read English, here's an example by a company called 3M where they've actually hidden uh, into the sign some information about what the sign says for the car. And you could actually even put even greater information in there as well. So these are just a few examples of what's out there. But from a pavement design and construction standpoint, there's a few things that we probably know are going to happen. One thing is vehicles are getting smarter and smarter and they're wandering less. And we know when vehicles don't wander, that's going to create a different loading scenario and performance on our pavements. Uh, with regard to trucks, the platooning, we've already had uh, uh, live demos of that done throughout the country. When trucks get closer together, that's also an issue, a challenge primarily for our structures friends that are doing the bridges. 
you know, when we figure out the loading on the bridge, all of a sudden the trucks can get closer together. What does that mean? Uh, with this new technology that allows us to have less wander, there's been consideration about creating additional lanes within the existing real estate. So narrowing the lanes down. And what does that mean with regard to how we would design those systems? Some of the more fun thing is once we go fully autonomous, what if we get rid of intersections altogether and the cars just talk to each other as they go through the intersections? So then you don't have issues like the stopping and the shoving. And then for us uh, who were charged with rebuilding and maintaining this, what do we do to the future of the work zone? As we have more and more technology that lets the vehicles talk to the infrastructure so that we can have a safer environment for people that are out there in the traffic and making sure we're getting a good performing pavement system. So we know we're gonna have increased nighttime freight. We know we're gonna have more and more demands on the durability of our system. And we're being asked to be more resilient, covering from events. And we know that smoothness, if you look at life cycle assessment, is kind of key within this. So as we build the pavements today and the infrastructure today, how do we future ready that system? How are we thinking about that? Maybe you might think for concrete pavements, ah, the dog, I told you would bark at least once. Uh, maybe we think about um, changing our dial bar spacing, uh, thinking that we're gonna have less water. Maybe we think about more durable systems with regard to our asphalt systems. Another one that's really fun and challenging is this idea of big data and big data analytics and what it's potentially gonna do or it's gonna do to surface transportation. So right now there's a whole host of people that are out looking at big data and trying to figure out how to monetize it and find second use cases for it. So if you go out and do a Google search, here's the kind of framework you need to know for big data. There are five V's. First one is big data itself has volume. Uh, we're talking exabytes, 10 to the 18th. That's a lot of zeros. The next one it has is velocity, and that's the relevance of the data. As the data becomes available, and then as the data becomes useful, and then as the data becomes useless, that's its velocity. A variety of data coming from all kinds of different sources that somehow you have to pull together into something a little more meeting. The veracity of the data. Uh, I'll give you a simple example in pavements. We've long talked about, could we take the accelerometer in our phones and get something like IRI? Yeah, we probably could. Would it be as good as measuring the IRI? No, we could It's not gonna be able to do that. But if we get enough of this data from the phone, is it good enough? And then the next one is the use case scenarios. An example of that in pavements is happening right now. Uh, the Federation of European Highway Research Laboratories, or FERAL, is working with Germany's version of federal highways, FAST. Um, this is a gentleman named Dirk Jensen. They're looking at big data from a pavement standpoint what type of data sources are out there that are being made available and how could we use that right now and how we manage our pavement system. For us on the federal highway side is how do we keep up with all of this? Uh, I'm working you know, with our head of information technology looking at big data because from a policy standpoint, we wanna make sure that we're creating a framework that allows us to innovate. Uh, one of the examples used at a big data conference was, what if the Wright brothers had to wait for Washington, D.C. to develop policy and guidance for man-powered flight? You think it would have happened at the same rate? Probably not, because we would have been trying to devise policy and guidance around something we really don't understand. So my question for Dr. Ahmad today is, what do we do when groups like Amazon, Grubhub, Nexar, Lyft here, they know more about our infrastructure than our state DOTs. At this year's TRB, uh, General Motors had several of their staff members trying to figure out how they could use the data that they're capturing from something called OnStar, if you have one of those vehicles. There's all this information they're capturing about hard braking and uh, the suspension response, coupled with GPS that tells them about the payment system that they could then repackage and maybe sell back to the DOTs. Uh, Nexar is a company that's a dash cam. They're capturing data right now to help insurance companies lower your rates, but then they're also reselling that information to townships about their signage. So it's a really interesting time to be in transportation because our common data sources are radically changing and they're changing fast. 
So before I transition into theory, uh, any thoughts or questions about what I just said? Okay, so let's drop into a little bit of theory. So, like I said, I read a lot. Uh, one of my pleasure books that I read recently uh, was by Jarrett Diamond, The Fate of Human Societies, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Really fun book. And in chapter 15, uh, yeah. oh, I have a question. What's the question? Thanks. Hello? Oops, summary went back to mute. Um, so in Jared Diamond's book, I was in chapter 15 and I just started laughing. I was like, ah, I'm once again reading an innovation book. Some societies will be more open to innovation and some will be more resistant. Is anybody willing to unmute and take a guess at what happened to those societies that were more resistant to innovation? They disappeared. They disappeared or they got conquered or they got absorbed by another society. Exactly, exactly. If you resist innovation, you fall behind. And when you fall behind in a global standpoint, you're gone. Now, um, this diffusion innovation is nothing new, uh, but it became kind of formalized back in the 1920s and 1930s in the Midwest. Uh, researchers were looking at how independent farmers were adopting at very different rates, hybrid seeds, equipment, and technology. And for these hybrid seeds, equipment, and technology, it was kind of a no-brainer that this was going to make yielding better, make the, the crop more resistant to blight. But for some reason, farmers were resistant. So this started this whole idea of looking at diffusion of innovation. And a gentleman named Everett Rogers, uh, who uh, got his PhD work on this and then spent his life work kind of building this law of diffusion innovation, uh, is one of the key players in this. His work is often cited. But when you look at an innovation, uh, you know, it could be what you're working on for your dissertation. The first question you got to ask is, what's its relative advantage? Is it competing with something else that's out in the marketplace? If it's so much better, is it compatible with the existing system or is it going to be very disruptive to use? How complicated is it for somebody to understand and use? How difficult or safe is it to try? And then once you try, how observable are the results? So I'll give you the example of warm mix asphalt. I was involved in the international scan that looked at warm mix asphalt in Europe and then brought it back and then deployed it nationally under something called the Everyday Counts Program. The relative advantage for warm mix asphalt was it reduced the temperature you produce asphalt with, which reduced emissions, uh, created a better work environment uh, for uh, workers out on the roadway. And because you were doing it at a lower temperature, you needed less energy or uh, fuel to make that material. So there were advantages to that. And we felt that the technologies would allow us to get equal or better performance. Now, it was still mostly rock, sand, and sticky stuff. So it was compatible with our existing system. The only thing you needed to do was do some enhancements to the asphalt production facility, which could be put in temporary, which was really important that you could try it. It was complex in certain uh, ways. There were some technologies that were very complicated and those fell away. But in general, this wasn't that complicated. We we're going to be putting either uh, water into the process to create foaming, a chemical package, and we were able to scale it up and try it and be able to observe that it went down. So this process was fulfilled with warm mix asphalt and we were able to advance and deploy it. Let's say you had a new technology that was very complicated and you thought you were gonna triple the life of your concrete or your asphalt pavement, but it was difficult to try. Um, that may create some real barriers, barriers for you to get that into place. The next thing that Rogers talks about is the importance of opinion leaders. And, and for this one, uh, I want to take a pause and, you know, you're at the University of Illinois. Um, Nathan Newmark was an opinion leader in his time. Uh, when I was there, there was this young man named Moreland Heron. Uh, he wasn't young at the time, but Moreland, uh, he produced people like Marshall Thompson and Ernie Barenberg, uh, worked very closely with Mike Darter. They are opinion leaders within the community. And today, some of the opinion leaders running around have last names like Al-Qadi. 
they can influence the spread of new technology both in a positive and in a negative way. If you have their support, they can be a catalyst for change. If you don't, they can slow the reaction down and actually stop it. So throughout your career, I want you to look at who are the opinion leaders in the room? Who are the decision makers? One day it may be you, or you need to find out who those people are or else you will find deploying innovation is extremely difficult. If you don't have them behind you, you will never be able to actually diffuse technology. So this is a curve that Rogers uh, developed uh, as he worked through his research, and it, it is often reused by people, sometimes with credit, not, not always. Uh, the, the orange line or the yellow line uh, shows market penetration, and uh, this can take anywhere from eight months to a lifetime to get market penetration or not at all. And I thought this when I first started looking at this, the people you want to focus in on are the innovators. They're the crazy people that will wait in line three hours to get the latest version of the iPhone. They actually don't drive the market. They, they do drive initial sales and they, they will try things, but really the early adopters are where your opinion leaders are found. We still need those crazy people to give us proving ground to try something new, but the early adopters will let you know if what you have has the potential to really make its way into our transportation community. Uh, an example of this is uh, if you did asphalt mix design, you probably did something called SuperPave. I was involved in the original deployment of SuperPave. And uh, as a, a young engineer, I was really impressed with the fact that my bosses, uh, John D'Angelo, Ted Farragut, knew to engage key opinion leaders in the state and bring them on board because once the people that usually lead the pack were trying it, others followed suit. So this is another important thing as you're thinking about taking an innovation and putting it into practice is identifying not just the innovators, because they're gonna let you try it, but who would the early adopters be and who are the true opinion leaders? The last one that is stressed throughout uh, Roger's work is don't get overly excited about your innovation. Be really focused on your customers, the end users, and understand their needs, because you may be selling something wrong. You may be describing it from your perspective, and this is something we, we, and I mean this collectively, me included, as engineers, we get really excited about the technology, but we forget to explain why. If you can't tell me the why of your technology and that why is related to the person who's gonna use its needs, then they're probably not gonna to listen to you or they're gonna just think, well, you're kind of smart, but I don't really need what you're doing. Um, Good friend of mine, his name is David Essie. He's uh, the equivalent of me at a state level in Wisconsin. Uh, he heads up their innovation program. He has this weird blend uh, of, <laughs> bless you, bless you. Somebody just sneezed. He has this weird blend of education. He is a civil engineer with a marketing communication degree as well. And he said some one time in a meeting and I had to write it down. He said, you know, there's a lot of things that are invented, but the difference between an invention and an innovation that is actually used is your ability to market and communicate. So you have to be able to understand who the decision makers are. You have to be able to understand what their needs are. You have to communicate that out in a clear, concise manner. And then you may, you may be able to do something with it. Ironically, <laughs> the people that will ultimately be using it, um, oftentimes in civil engineering, go through some kind of bureaucracy, a state DOT, the Federal Highway Administration, uh, a local township, but bureaucracies are a normalizing force. We like to surround ourselves with things that make us comfortable. And what I mean by that is in holding on to this thing that is the public trust so people feel comfortable going over our roads and bridges, uh, we surround ourselves with ASHTO specification, regulations, standards. We do uh, quality assurance testing. And when you surround yourself with all these things, it comes, it's very difficult sometimes to see how an innovation fits in because oftentimes the thing you're trying to re replace, the standards have all been built around it. So to put something new into place means you have to break or open up the specifications and that can cause a lot of consternation 
uh, from the people that are in charge of those standards. Warm mix was an example of that. We had to come up with provisional standards. We had to get kind of exemptions. All kinds of things had to happen before we could actually put pavement down at a routine level out in the field. So before I transition to the next part, any questions about, first of all, we had this really fun time to be civil engineers. Lots of crazy things going on out within our community. Um, and change management theory. Any questions or thoughts you want to share back now before I continue into the next section? All right, Mr. Bill Babrick, I'm going to call you out. Does this all make sense? It does. It does. I've, I've heard some of this stuff before, Tom. You're doing, it's, it's good stuff. Okay, just checking, just checking. I'm going to call him Walla next, and then I'm going to jump down. And, and I did like that Wisconsin quote, by the way. That was uh, fitting. It, it's true. It, it, uh, another friend of mine, uh, he said, and he's in the medical industry. Um, he said, you know, if you can't explain something to a second grader, you don't understand it well enough. And, and um, it's, you it's really that, shouldn't talk about DOT executives that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're being recorded. I won't respond back to that. Um, another one I want to talk about is how we reword our conversation, uh, because oftentimes, Great ideas never make it to the boss because we go talk to one of our peers first and we don't get the warmest of receptions. Um, and we have to reword the conversation to stop limiting our potential. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, you, you come with an idea and you talk to somebody who you value their opinion, they're your peer. And they give you a response back like, ah, you know, we tried something like that before. Do you really want to go down there? well, you know, you're stretching your own neck out. Uh, I don't really have your back on this. Or they just kind of disengage. They pull away from you as you're trying something new. Uh, so another friend of mine, Brian Ness, he's the director of Idaho DOT. He completely transformed an otherwise failing Department of Transportation with two words. And I'm not underestimating that statement. He made all of his employees that completely knew their job and they knew all the reasons why not to do innovative things. And they would explain over and over again. He said, let's rethink that. Let's lean into ideas with yes, if. And it almost created an improvisational environment so that all of a sudden everyone within the DOT was sharing ideas they had been keeping inside them for their entire careers and it really percolated to a transformative DOT to now Idaho is one of the most innovative out there. So the next time someone comes to you with a crazy idea that you really don't agree with, start with the phrase, yes, if, and then see where it leads you. And you might be surprised. This is a learned skill. The first few times you try it, it's going to be very awkward. So do it within your group. Uh, you know, Skype with a friend today if there's an idea you have. Now, another leader or pretty much a champion within the transportation community and he is a friend of mine named Carlos Paceros. Uh, he is the executive director of Utah DOT. Uh, Carlos is an engineer, but he's an amazing executive as well. Uh, when he was the head of president of AASHTO a year ago, uh, he basically did a national tour and he focused in on just two things. And the more I thought about it, and I've seen him give a presentation on this multiple times, I'm like, it's just two things, trust and relationship. How do you develop trust and how do you build relationships? Because if you don't have either of those, you can have the best idea in the world and it will go nowhere. And that is also a learned skill. Lots of books on that. Uh, but really taking the time to listen, that's relationship. And for trust, really taking the time to understand other people's needs and seeing how you can add value to it. So if you take nothing from me today, yes, if, trust in relationships. Those are key. Get all those right. You'll find your career is super easy. So that's kind of my preamble. And now I want to go through my day job, uh, some of the things that I'm really excited about at the Federal Highway Administration, what we're working on, because uh, I am the director for the Center for Accelerating Innovation. And that is just crazy to say out loud. 
I get to play with innovation every day and I get to work with really amazing people. So we have a portfolio of tools that we provide to our state DOT partners to help them and the locals to help them accelerate the adoption of innovation. Uh, as I like to say, I'm an impatient person. I really, really don't like things to not be used if they're good. So how can we get the really good stuff into practice even quicker? So we like acronyms in the federal government. So I have a range of three and four letter acronyms I'm gonna share with you. The first one is accelerating market readiness. And this is a photograph of Bill Babrick and myself um, trying to demonstrate that yes, you can truly bridge the gap between research and practice. Uh, and this is a gap that is often hard to overcome. A lot of researchers think that implementation of a research finding is they wrote a report and made it available. No, that's, you've got an invention at that point, or you've got a finding at that point. It isn't until an innovation is truly in practice and being used on a routine basis that you've gained market or you've made an impact with your idea. So how do we do this? Um, well, the way Federal Highways has done this since the day of the Bureau of Road Inquiry is we like to demonstrate things in the field. Here's an example on uh, a, a dead person's curve. It sounds funny to say a dead man's curve. Here's a, here's a dangerous curve that we really wanted to indicate, hey, you need to make a left-hand turn. Someone came up with an idea that couldn't we sequence the chevrons and make it so it's just plain obvious where the roadway is going. Uh, so under a demonstration project, uh, we tried 12 different treatment sites in five different states, and we found that this approach, when you put it into place, sig sig significantly and statistically reduced crashes and saved lives. So here's an example where someone had a really good idea. We were able to put it out in the right of way, try it, and be able to show definitively that this is a good treatment to try and use. So under the Accelerated Market Readiness Program, we're looking not at small change, but noteworthy, emerging and disruptive change uh, that is happening within our transportation community. So something that significantly advances the state of the practice, something that's gap filling and something that's game changing. So gap filling would be uh, drones. Or, so drones are something we haven't had before. They allow us to get information in a very different way. Game changing would be autonomous vehicles. Uh, it's really changing the way the loading is being applied to the systems that we're building today. So under the Accelerated Market Readiness Program, we wanted to make sure as we rolled this out, we tied it to our agency's goal. Not surprisingly, and this hasn't changed throughout my career, and I've been with Federal Highways for 30 years, our main goal is safety. You know, we have loss of lives every year on our roadways, and how can we make them safer? The next one is, how do we get projects out quicker? And then how do we make our infrastructure last longer? So this past year, we put out a broad agency announcement to anybody, put $3 million behind it, and we're currently in the process of selecting about a dozen or so innovations that we're gonna put money behind, get them out in the field, document, and then share the results. I'll give you an example of some things we're working on uh, internally with regard to federal highways right now, but this is something we think is a gap that needs to be continuously fed because as great research comes out, it's not great research to me until it is in practice. Um, here's an idea that came out of the Federal Highway Administration's Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center. One of the number one challenges we have with bridges is bridge scour. So when you get scouring around bridge piers, bridges don't do that well. So the challenge we had as civil engineers, we would go out and we'd pull samples of we're either going to maintain or upgrade a bridge or we're gonna build a bridge, and we bring it back to the lab and that process to serve the sample. And in disturbing the sample, the test results we get back in the lab really don't mean a whole lot as to what we have out in the field. So would there be a way to actually measure scour uh, resistance in situ. And lo and behold, they have developed something that you can. And we're currently looking at the erodibility of soils in place, non-disturbing the samples. And this project, when it was initially coming out of research, 
they were looking at a 10 to 15 year deployment cycle. Uh, they reached out to my office. We've now got multiple demonstrations going on all over the country, and we're hoping to get this technology out within the next three to five years. Uh, another one that has become kind of a game changer, but it's also a little bit of a no brainer is we all have these cellular devices that we can go out. And unfortunately, we have severe weather events that happen all the time. We call them uh, emergency events. And for federal highways, we can release funds under something called an ER. And that process can take several years to pay back or provide funding to states that are doing emergency relief to get their infrastructure back in place. So a gentleman in our Federal Lands Highway Division said, could we make a mobile app? Because you know these, these phones and tablets have GPS, they have cameras. Is there a way we can make a mobile solution for assessment and reporting, MSAR? And uh, they were able to do this. And then unfortunately, um, Texas had a hurricane, some Hurricane Harvey in 2017. And at that point, we had put that app into a pilot standpoint. Texas took it, used it. They were able to accelerate the ER funding to within seven months instead of two years using a paper process. And they estimated not only did they get the money quicker, but they saved over a million dollars uh, just on one event. This application uh, cost the Federal Highway Administration a little over $300,000 to develop. And in its singular use, in one singular use, we saved over a million dollars beyond its development stages. So that's a great example of something we've been able to do under accelerating market readiness. The next one is a network. Um, so you're, you're currently working within your community, within grad school. Uh, you've probably engaged in CRB, uh, American Society of Civil Engineers. How do you use your network to help you understand emerging technology and also help you to deploy new technology? Well, under uh, the Center for Accelerating Innovation, we help stand up STICs, State Transportation Innovation Councils. And the way we incentivize this is we provide each state up to $100,000 a year, use or lose, to talk about innovation and use it for needs that they have. So the STIC model starts with up to $100,000, and it can be used for anything. Um, each state has a STIC that has been stood up. So we have 52 STICs currently operating, one in D.C. and one in Puerto Rico in all 50 states. And they use these funds for specification development, hiring consultants to help them uh, enhance specifications for new technologies, technical assistance and training, uh, hosting innovation days where they showcase ideas that are happening. And then one of my favorite uses is they take the money to go see other states or locals that are doing something innovative or share something innovative they're doing back. Uh, here's an example that may seem, again, like a no-brainer, but um, something that happened under the sticks that helped us accelerate the use of drones. So New Jersey uh, was looking at the technology of drones. Federal Highway Administration came in and joined them. They hosted a peer exchange. And during the peer exchange, they talked about all of the logistical and regulation side of the house for what they could and couldn't do with drones. Today, that 2017 peer exchange has now made New Jersey the leader in the nation. Uh, New Jersey DOT is a very interesting body in the sense that they just don't have uh, typical infrastructure. They have an anal coastal, they have uh, waterways that they maintain, uh, rail. They are uh, everything but uh, planes in the air that they're dealing with. They've come up with over 38 use cases that have high return on investment that are providing them with data that they never thought was imaginable for, saving time and money. And it's also created a fleet of drone pilots that are within the DOT. So a whole new discipline has been born out of this. Uh, we're currently advancing this technology and there's something I'm gonna talk about in a second, which is the Everyday Counts program. Um, but one other item uh, that we use is incentive funding because if you're gonna try something new, the first time you try it, it is gonna cost more. And how do we incentivize people from taking risk? Uh, so there's something called the Accelerated Innovation Deployment or AID Demonstration Program. Uh, we provide up to a million dollars 
of incentive funding on a project to pay for the delta cost of an innovation. Uh, what we're looking at right here is something called GRS IBS, uh, an innovative um, bridge foundation system that is low cost, but the first time you do it, it could be a risk to you. So aid has been a highly successful way for us to get projects out into the field and piggyback existing infrastructure projects. We can't afford to pay for an entire bridge, but we can afford to pay for an innovation on a bridge. Uh, so far, we've put over uh, close to $70 million in this program. Uh, close to 100 awards have been made. And like I said, it's up to a million dollars to cover the delta cost of the innovation. I'll give you an example of one, which was kind of fun to me. Uh, if you go to Missouri, <laughs> you'll see this, the, the bridge in the front is the bridge I'm talking about, the bridge in the back could use a paint job, that's a rail bridge. Uh, the Big Bend Boulevard Bridge needed to be repainted. And the current state of the practice that Missouri was using was a three coat system uh, that required time and drying time and set time. There was also an issue when you use these three coat systems. If you get your timing wrong, uh, you actually get a very poor product. You have to have your timing right. Uh, if the, some of the epoxy is set too hard, they won't accept the next uh, substance. Well, Missouri heard about this coating system that was being used on steel by the Department of Defense, actually on steel tanks. As you know, a tank is sort of like a bridge. It's a hunk of steel that sits out and it deals with extreme weather. We don't usually shoot at our bridges, but if the epoxy system works good on a tank, it might work really good on a bridge. So it is a nano coating system uh, that provides passive corrosion protection. And what they found by using this Department of Defense technology, they could reduce their application time because it only required two coats. They think they're gonna get greatly increased durability, so they're not gonna to have to come back and maintain that bridge as frequently as they would have. They minimized traffic impacts because it was only a two coat system. And because they minimized traffic impacts, they saved on user cost as well. So the last one I want to discuss, so th those are the, the first three of the portfolio of programs that we use to help take ideas that are coming out of DOTs, locals, and universities, and put them into place. Uh, one is accelerating market readiness. The next one is supporting communities of innovation groups called STICs, and then providing incentive funds to try innovation out on projects. The last one, which is kind of the first one in this process, this is what got the whole center started, is something called the Everyday Counts Program. And EDC looks at doing four things. How do we take market-ready, proven, but underutilized innovations? So we have something that works, and it's working well somewhere in the world, and it does one of four things. It shortens our ability to deliver our projects. It enhances roadway safety. That should be number one. It reduces traffic congestion and it integrates automation into the process. This program is actually an accelerated program in that every two years we go through the cycle of identifying new and proven technology and then we provide a lot of resource to deployment teams to create awareness and get states and locals to try new innovations and put them out. Um, give me an example of one. So you may know about high performance concrete. Well, did you know there's something called ultra high performance concrete? Uh, so UHPC gets rid of the big rocks, puts in steel fibers, and it's intended for the connection of precast concrete panels, which tends to be the weak point when you're doing accelerated construction or accelerated bridge construction. So UHPC technology is simple to use, it's strong and it's long lasting and it's now gone national. We've done two cycles of promoting this under the Everyday Counts program. And one of the examples that you see here on the upper right is the Pulaski Skyway. To date, it's the largest application where a million square feet of bridge deck was connected with almost 5,000 cubic yards of ultra high performance concrete for connection. Uh, this is also one where we provide some incentive funding to it as well. But this allows us to put things in place and do it well. Under the Everyday Counts program, we provided training, resources, draft specifications, and peer exchanges to make it so states like New Jersey were willing to try the technology. 
Uh, the next one I'm going to share, and I have to caveat this one, this one is very personal to me, um, is uh, this past year we saw a reduction in overall fatalities on our network. So I'm getting a flash up there. Is someone asking a question? Someone have a question for me? It's just somebody clicking in. Um, so we saw a decrease in overall fatalities uh, that were transportation related, but we saw an increase in two areas. One is our pedestrians and the other is our cyclists. Those two areas increased significantly. Um, we have been focusing now uh, for the past several years on increasing safety for pedestrians. And one of the initiatives is affectionately known as STEP, Safe Transportation for Every Pedestrian, so S-T-E-P. Uh, there will probably be another uh, pedestrian related uh, innovation promoted in the next round of Everyday Counts as well, if I have my way. The reason why this is important to me is the photograph that I use uh, in this slide. You see a bunch of EMTs uh, posing around somebody. They're not posing. That's actually my daughter. Uh, she is absolutely fine, uh, but she was struck by a vehicle in a crosswalk uh, on campus on her last day of her freshman year. Uh, she thought the driver saw her. The driver was either distracted or it was a rain event, uh, couldn't quite see her. Uh, but fortunately, she is okay. But I have a passion about making it so that not only do pedestrians understand their role, but we do everything possible to make our roadways better for our pedestrians and cyclists. So here's an example of how that works. Florida um, took the concepts of STEP and they had a high crash high use corridor. So here's an intersection. Uh, this is what was used during the public hearings and they thought they could use a tool called a pedestrian hybrid beacon to create greater awareness to traffic as pedestrians tried to cross the street. So as nice as that graphic looks, here's what the real street looks like. So you can imagine on a busy day, you're on that street corner and you need to get across. And there's a crosswalk, there's signs, right? the signs kind of get lost, like a lot of signs get lost. How do we create greater awareness? So the hybrid beacons was the solution they elected to use. And what they found for this intersection, um, the average six year crash rate was 20 a year. We're getting struck either cyclist or pedestrian. By just putting the hybrid beacons in, they were able to reduce that down to seven. Seven isn't zero, but seven is a whole lot better than 20. So here's a really good example of the state taking something promoted through the Everyday Counts program, understanding that there's a toolkit out there, applying that toolkit and getting real data back. And the impact of the Everyday Counts program has been pretty incredible. Um, to date, every state has used at least 19 of the 52 innovations that we've promoted, and some states have adopted more than 40. And all of these are intended to save lives, save time, save money, and be more resource responsible. So I'm gonna transition now into my conclusion, conclusions. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, start teeing those up and hopefully we'll have some good discussion as we go. So here's what I covered today and here's what I'd like you to think about. And then in the end, I, anything I said that really resonated that's getting you to think. Um, the first one is, as civil engineers, uh, we're entrusted with the public's trust. And it's really important for us to understand their needs. And their needs are getting more and more complex. Or maybe they've always been that complex, but our understanding of that complexity is much more aware. Uh, simplify your language. Think about a presentation that you're about to give or one that you just gave. And if you're using a lot of multi-syllabic terms in there, how do you simplify it in a way that the audience really understands your why? And you should always start with and end with your why. As I started down this journey, I told you, we're gonna talk about our future. And our future is really innovation and innovation is hard, but there's some really good tools and philosophies out there for how we can think about and be more successful in how we deploy new technologies. Uh, the next one is engage your stakeholders, the people that are going to be involved in the process. And from a research community standpoint, the earlier you do that, 
the sooner you get their buy-in and the sooner you get their input into the process. Having someone who is part of industry or not just academia that's looking at your ideas from the get-go is really, really powerful. Uh, D is from my friend Brian Ness. Reworld your conversation. Next time you're talking to a friend, colleague, or someone that you don't particularly like, yes if, yes if, and you'll see that it really will change the conversation. Don't tell them no because. We can all can think of reasons why not to. Next one is invest time and money in the new opportunities and take risks. If you're not spending a little bit of your time each day, each week, setting aside for you to learn something new, you are not growing as a person or as an engineer. And I take this to heart. If, if you work for me, um, we call them hikes on my team. I pay my staff. I tell my staff at least once a week, I want you 30 minutes looking at something not related to your job. If you do it every day, that's fantastic. But spend a little bit of time, set it aside, go for a walk. I know a lot of us are finding extra time to walk these days, but go for a walk for just 20 minutes and you'll find you'll come back fresh and engaged. So focus on your customer, simplify, simplify your language, engage your stakeholders, reword your conversation, and invest your time to take a little risk. The next one was openly discuss competing alternatives. That's where that yes, if comes in. Think about why it isn't happening. If it's not happening right now, that means it's one of those hard ones. What's stopping it? Is it the fact that we've just been, become so ingrained that the only way to do it is the way we've always done it? Create opportunity to be creative and incubate ideas. That's David Essie. Um, David looks for opportunities to engage, uh, collaborate, pull things together. And then from Carlos, it really just comes down to two things. In all of these, if you're developing relationships and you're establishing trust, the implementation of new ideas is easy because people trust you and you know what they need. So you're not gonna be trying to push something on them that they don't need. And the last one, and this is most important for me to you, um, this isn't a challenge that I'm taking on. Really, the future of highways comes down to one person, and that's you. You are the new crop of minds that are gonna come up with the innovations and the ideas that help really meet these incredible challenges and opportunities we're facing right now. Uh, and I'll end with another quote, and I unfortunately, this quote, I don't know who to attribute it to, but I love the quote. Innovation isn't what innovators do, it's what customers and clients adopt. So if you want to put the title on yourself that you think you're an innovative engineer, you have to ask yourself, what, what are you doing right now that people have accepted and adopt that they weren't already going to do anyhow? Uh, I've got some really neat things in my career. I was, I was fortunate to be part of the deployment of the SuperPave system. It changed the way we did that. I, I worked with a colleague, John Bukowski, and helped deploy Stone Matrix Asphalt SMA. Warm Mix was part of the deployment. I, I've had some really great successes. Uh, I've been a part of some amazing teams that have had some really great successes. So with that, uh, I'm gonna end with my summary slide and explain that to you because it's a little crazy in itself. And I'd love to hear your questions and comments. So we'll open those mics up. So here's my closing slide I like to use a lot. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate, very blessed. I have three amazing children. Uh, they're all in the house right now, which is a little unique. Um, in the upper right, do you know what happens when you have a gymnast that decides to get in the theater? You get Connor. Uh, he, he does some antics on the stage all the time. It may look like he's six feet off the ground. That's because he's about six feet off the ground. Uh, my middle boy has a developmental delay and he's in the golf. So if he's in the golf, I'm in the golf. Uh, do Special Olympics golf with him. Uh, his drive is straighter than mine, and it's getting to be the same length as mine, which is kind of crazy. And then uh, my baby girl, my oldest, uh, is Ashley. Uh, quick story on Ashley. Uh, I used to have a white pickup truck. Uh, it was my truck to go to and from uh, the hardware store. It was a white pickup truck. And my high school daughter said, hey, Dad, can I paint the truck? 
I thought it was going to have a cartoon character on the bumper when I came home. That's Ashley Struck now. Uh, that's what I came home to, and I smiled because talk about being innovative and creative. And I, I'm very proud that on the day she said, can I paint the truck? I just said yes. I didn't say yes if, I just said yes. And the product has been amazing. So with that, I, I hope you enjoyed or heard something today that made you think or you learned about something new. I'd love to open this up for questions. Uh, I'm gonna close out on my slideshow and hopefully we'll go back to faces here and let's see what we get. So, uh, hey Walla, can you see just me again? We see everyone right now. Oh, you see everyone right now. Okay, fantastic. So any questions or comments? What, what's something I said that is challenges the way you think or that you agree with or something you might try new? Tom, can you hear me? I can hear you, Walla. I can even okay. see you. <laughs> it's an excellent presentation, Tom. It really is. But I have a question that with all the technology that is happening and changes in how smart vehicles are, Based on policies, do you think senior people and people with le uh, who are legally blind, for example, do you think the requirements for getting a license will change? That, see, that's a great question. And the autonomous folks uh, are looking at that. W one of the things that we're going to create with autonomous vehicles is access. And once we get to the point where we have a level five autonomous vehicle, you can sit in the back seat. You can be blind. You can be uh, in a wheelchair. It's going to create huge access and opportunity. So legally blind, yeah, probably. We're, we're going to see that within our lifetime. We will, once, once we have that level autonomous vehicle. I will tell you, though, as cool as it is to watch the various cars drive around, uh, the people that are in the know, we're probably still a decade out to really have that vehicle that can handle all the scenarios and stuff that we throw at them. And one important thing with regard to autonomous is there will still be crashes. There will still be fatalities. There will, still be, there will still be life. And if we're gonna set the bar that autonomous means zero deaths, we're trying to get towards zero deaths, but it certainly will not create that environment. There's still gonna be the other muck we running around. Okay, so I have another person that's dropping in that says own 7635. You got a question or a comment or something you're responding back to? Yeah, Tom, this is Imad. Uh, I, Hi. I think that was, that was a very inspiring talk. I, I truly appreciate it. And I would like to make a comment that uh, it's, it's really important to know uh, what's happening at your end and all these new products. And working with the Department of Transportation here in Illinois, we did actually put to use, or we will put to use very shortly, uh, the development that you have in bridge scouring. And the reason because we have done several projects on this, as the Department of Transportation with the ICT, and then recently we were planning to do a new project, and when we know about uh, the product that was developed through your organization, we got excited and I think uh, we will be working with this product soon in a project. So I think communication is very, very important. And I would appreciate if you can share with us uh, the uh, URL for all the new products that have been developed or being developed right now. So people can make use of that and they don't have to reinvent the wheel. But that was a very inspiring uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much. You, you bring up one of the biggest challenges we still have, even with all this technology, um, the reinventing of the wheel. And certain DOTs will do things and they don't think they're a big deal, but they're huge time savers. And how do we share that? Uh, I'm working with a group called uh, Ashto has a research and innovation um, special committee. Uh, they were formerly uh, RAC over, over score. And we're looking at how do we create a pathway to innovation, identify all of those various tools or resources available for people, and then a clearinghouse. And not a clearinghouse that's meant to be, here's everything, a prioritized, identified clearinghouse. 
Uh, with regard to the things that I discussed today, I will certainly share uh, the website. It's super easy to find. Go on any search engine, type Everyday Counts, FHWA. That'll bring you to my homepage. You'll see all four of these programs. They're tabbed out. We spend a lot of time making our website interactive, videos, training things. Um, but the, the broader thing is you in Illinois come up with a neat idea or someone in a maintenance shop comes up with something that is a back-saving, time-saving automation, and they, they make it and they use it. How do we get that out there? How do we share that? So we are looking heavily at uh, right now, how do we create a clearinghouse? There's an NCHRP study that's coming together because not only how do we create a clearinghouse, how do we sustain it? So it doesn't just become one more thing that gets stood up and used for only two years. Um, so that, that study is going before uh, ASHTO score just in the next week. So you bring up a really good point, but I, I will share um, the, the website for mine and also, ASHTO has an innovation initiative as well that we partner with. So great. Uh, so I, I got some thank yous up in here. I'm reading. Um, any other questions or comments or thoughts? Don't be shy. Hi, Walla. I see you waving. You got I have another a question? question. <laughs> you mentioned something very good, which is the working force. So how to get people interested in transportation engineering. And in particular, as you know, our area, which is pavement engineering, especially construction and so forth. So, I mean, in Massachusetts, we're working with a community college, which is centered to the state, and we're going to develop a program to attract people. But your presentation is very, very good for the young generation. So would it be available that we can show it, to the, especially the undergraduates? Because this new generation would get excited with all the technology and so Absolutely. would this presentation be available that we can run in one of our classes and hopefully when life gets back to normal we can invite you up here you can always invite me up there and uh while i was one of the uh, youngest people i know you can see his <laughs> smile um i want you to be aware Thank of a resource you. i want you to be aware of a resource uh and i will send this link out as well um, ASHTO, ARPA, AGC, Federal Highways, uh, Department of Labor partnered on a highway construction workforce partnership. And there's been a playbook put together. Uh, I'll actually, one of the TRB committees with Bob McGinnis has asked me to, to talk about this and I can share a presentation on that as well. Uh, right now there are, are toolkits and approaches being developed to, to help draw people and attract people into the full range of transportation. Uh, it's hashtag roads to your future is what we're looking at. And if you do highway construction workforce development, uh, we have actually stood up in addition to my center for accelerating innovation, we have a center for transportation workforce development. And that's, that's their key is how, how do we encourage people in at all levels into the workforce with regard to transportation. The numbers are, are kind of scary. The number of people yeah. that are potentially retiring versus the number of people coming in. Yes. And we can't just assume automation is going to fix it. Uh, it it's not going to fix it. We need to attract people in. So th that's a great point you bring up. And we're hoping under EDC round six, we have a workforce initiative. That's one of the things that's been proposed. And I'm really excited about that one um, moving forward. It's got high support from uh, a number of our stakeholders. Thanks. Other yeah, good question, Lala. Tom, Tom, a comment if I could. Yes, Mr. Bill. So I, I've had the opportunity to, to work with you in these programs for a good number of years. And recently, uh, I had an opportunity to talk to many of the folks from around the country who've been participating in the EDC program. And while they all talked about their innovation and the, the cool thing they were doing, much like what you put up on the screen, I want to harken back to, to one of your closing comments, that the comment about trust and relationship. because to a person, every single person I talk to who has talked about the successes of the programs that you've been, been leading, Tom, every one of them talked about the network of people that they're working with, the, the trust relationships, the breaking down of silos and barriers within organizations, between organizations, and that is what has really helped drive innovation. So, you know, kudos to you and the team and, and a lot of it is you're teaching, you think you're teaching them about something cool, technical to do, 
what you're really teaching them is how to interact with one another, to trust one another, and to work together toward a common goal. And you know, it's it's amazing to to listen to, but but you know, that's something the students don't always hear. Maybe they're hearing more about the cool technical thing. Well, um, one of the things we do under the Everyday Counts model that's uh, somewhat behind the curtain is we run our deployment team through a marketing and communication class. Uh, it's affectionately known as Leap Not Creep. Uh, and we're hoping to set that up as, uh, we're updating the slides right now and we're, we're hoping to set that up as a, a web-based resource. And really it, it, it takes us geeky engineers and it makes us think about what's the why, uh, doing a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, doing a risk assessment of that, coming up with a heat mapping, and then developing how you're going to engage and reach out. Um, I really appreciate the comment about the network. Uh, somebody asked me, uh, it, I was at an ASCE event in Chicago this past year, uh, and someone said, Tom, how'd you get on the agenda? I said, Ahmad asked me. And you know, for the people from the university that are on here today, uh, I talked about opinion leaders and thought leaders. Uh, Dr. al Qadi is one of those. And uh, don't underestimate that statement. He has had a huge impact on what we do. And when someone like that asks you to do something, you just do it. And you know, it's that trust and relationship building that occurs. And, and as I look at Wall up there as well, he's had a huge impact in the Northeast, is being able to find those people and work with those people and support those people. I, I look at my job as uh, I'm here to create an environment where others thrive. I'm just here to create a space where people can take risks. Uh, my days of deploying, you know, warm mix or super pave, that, that's what I used to do. Now what I do is I hope other people will, will take the yoke and push it out there. So uh, other thoughts or comments? Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is Sampath Kedari Sethi. I'm a PhD student at uh, UC Davis uh, uh, with Professor John Harvey. Uh, Hi, I love I, John. John's one of my favorite people. Okay. Yeah, uh, so, so is mine. <laughs> and uh, I'm working on uh, payment management systems for local government. So, and I was uh, wondering if there are some initiatives or uh, some kind of support that uh, your office or FHWA provides to, uh, to local governments and uh, any initiatives in that direction. Okay, so the, the stick incentive program that I talked about, state transportation, um, the, the sticks, each stick gets up to $100,000. It's for anything innovative that the state wants to use. So if a local government works with their, their local stick, and again, on the website, you can go down and see who the points of contacts are uh, for the stick they can provide some incentive funding. Uh, we've also had people look at the aid demonstration grants, to pilot things. Uh, it's not meant to pay for the implementation of a new system, but you could pilot ideas. Uh, so that's one that's been looked at as well. Uh, so th those are two quick tools that people could look at. Uh, $100,000 at a state level like California doesn't mean a lot. Um, it's kind of change in their couch, but $100,000. Uh, no, but it means a lot for us, for a local government. Yeah. $100,000 yeah, so, is make or break. Yeah. Yeah. So the stick incentive program would be a good place, but they have to work in partnership, in relationship with their, their local state stick. Uh, and for all the, the state transportation innovation councils, they're co-chaired by someone high in the DOT, as well as uh, the division administrator in the Federal Highway Administration. And in California, that's uh, Vince Vamana. Uh, other questions or comments? Hi, Thank Tom. you so much. I'm one of uh, Professor Al-Qaeda student. Um, I was hoping if you could comment on um, maybe some of your experience or maybe um, efforts that you're aware of to integrate separate directives. Um, I think you've mentioned different programs and even as a PhD student, we work, um, we tend to work very focused on a topic or, you know, a, a given um, uh, project. I guess my question is, if we are creating all these amazing tools, what are the efforts in actually integrating this into a system as a whole? Well, that, so I think at the beginning of your process, as you're talking about, um, you know, as you develop your hypothesis and you're just like, this is what I want to work on, you have to start at the beginning with what's, what's that look like in the context of the system? And if you are successful, how that fits within the system. And the best way to do that is the stakeholder engagement part of it is reaching out with who your your potential end users would be in that. 
I, I know sometimes in, in PhDs, you know, uh, you're, you're focusing very, very specific and, and deep uh, where you might be enhancing and tweaking a model. Uh, but even within that, it, understanding that that model would eventually go through uh, one of the AASHTO committees for adoption or inclusion or how you're going to validate that model and what that would mean. Uh, and that, that is a very challenging process. I know in having Dr. al there, he, he is engaged. He's engaged with the DOT. But the sooner you open yourself up to those questions of the why and then, all right, if the outcome is successful, where would this fit into current business practices? Uh, and you don't need to necessarily know, you, you won't know that all at the start of your PhD, but reaching out to people who do know those things is really important. Does that make sense? I, yeah. am, I answer, am I answering your question, I should ask? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, it, it's a good question, but it's sort of like, um, a lot of times uh, PhDs are, are or advancing a model or they're developing something, you have to really look at it from a system and ultimately how would this make it into the business models that we use. Other questions or comments? Hi, it's Yogesh. Hello. Uh, hello guys. We need to Hi. cut it short now because it's been 10 minutes over time. So you guys can send emails to Tom or communicate with him. But for now, we have to wrap it up for today. So thank you, Tom, for a okay. very nice presentation. And I hope you guys join us for some other Chem Chem Seminar Series uh, lectures. You can leave your email on the chat before you leave. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Javier, Tom. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye Maud Walla. Bye, Tom. Yeah.